This evening's scripture is found in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, on page number 847, in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. Good to be back from vacation and missed you guys. And um, I'm just happy to be back where we can uh, dive back into all of uh, this together and uh, looking forward to a good summer. Uh, real quickly, uh, when, you, when you came in, you, you saw these, you just saw the announcement about these. These are for you to hand out. We're going to be starting, starting this marriage series in a couple of weeks from today. Uh, I just want to make a, 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 something very obvious to you. Uh, this is a book actually by Mark and Grace Driscoll from Mars Hill Church, and so we're just going to take some of the principles in there. We preach the Bible here. This is not a topical church, but, but we felt like, you know, we as a staff have been running into a lot of issues where we realize there's a lot of marriages, our, ourselves included, where we we just need to know what the Bible says. And sometimes over the summer, we stop, we pause, and we take these times to talk about uh, some of these important topics like marriage. And so this is a great opportunity for you to invite friends and family and others who need to know what the Bible has to say about marriage. And there's a supporting book that goes along with it. We'll have some of those copies available for you to purchase if that's what you want to. But use this as an outreach. Uh, everything we do, we do so we can reach people for Jesus Christ. And this is a great opportunity for you to invite friends that may not normally come and they'll come because we're talking about such an important, relevant topic uh, like marriage. It's not family, it's marriage. And so uh, even if you're single, this is something you should come to. This is something you ought to be a part of because uh, we're going to be talking about what you ought to be striving for when it comes to your marriage, when it comes to relationships in the future. Uh, and we want you to be uh, well informed what the Bible has to say. And so we're going to stay close to the text of Scripture and, and would love uh, for you to come and be a part of that and invite your, your friends and family uh, to join you as well. So that's two weeks from today when that starts. Uh, we'll be in the book of Mark next week and then, uh, and then that'll take us, the marriage series will take us all the way through the rest of the summer, and then we'll pick up uh, back in uh, Mark in the fall. Okay, uh, before we get started, also, I just want to introduce a couple of people to you. Um, we're, we're growing as a church, and that means we need to grow as a staff and, uh, and get some of the support that we need. And so I want to just uh, ask a couple people to stand uh, so that you could put faces with names. And uh, the first one is Kelly Cook, and Kelly's right down here. Um, and you know what, Stephen, stand up with her, because uh, they're going to be coming as a package pretty soon. Uh, yeah. Kelly and Stephen will be married. That's why I had him stand with her. We'll be married uh, in the fall. Um, and Kelly and, and Stephen have been coming to church for uh, several years now. Kelly's going to be our new missions and outreach director. And so everything we do, you're going to be hearing actually about uh, a, a drive that we're going to do for the fall where we're going we're to put together backpacks for kids at Stanton Elementary School. And, uh, and so that's part of what she does, just other outreach opportunities we have. She's going to lead missions trips to Thailand and other places. And so we're super excited to have Kelly on board with us. Um, she's an APU grad and brings a lot of a talent to the table for us. She's been helping out already. She's part-time right now until she gets to her wedding, and then after the wedding, then we'll work her really hard. So, um, uh, but we're going to give her, give her some chance to, uh, to, to, uh, to get ready for the, for the wedding. Uh, and then I also want to introduce John White. John is right over here. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, John is familiar to many of you, as probably Kelly was as well, but, but, uh, but John is our new pastor, what we're calling our pastor of central operations, and this is a big, big portfolio. So any improvements you see, any of the, the things that are going on, administrative uh, things that happen at the church are going to fall uh, on John to take charge of. You've heard me talk about the need for an executive pastor before, and so we've kind of done things a little bit different, but John in many ways is filling that role, and so he just started a couple of weeks ago, and and, uh, and he's uh, recently, about a year ago, married to, to Jen. She's an RD over at APU. And, uh, and so we're excited to have uh, them on board as well. So take some time, uh, maybe today afterwards when we have our barbecue or whatever, take some time to talk to Kelly, uh, John, to welcome them, get to know them. Uh, we're super excited to have them with us. So, so thanks, guys. All right, well... Um, We're in Mark chapter 11, but before we really jump in there, um, if you're new to Foothill Church, if this is a new weekend for you, or maybe you haven't been with us the last year and a half, uh, I want to try and frame today by giving you a little context. I I hope that when you read Scripture, and especially when you read like the book of Mark or really any of Scripture, uh, you understand that that these these authors are making a point. Uh, These are not just disorganized, you know, let's tell this story, then let's tell this story, then let's tell that story. This is, they're trying, there's something they're driving at, okay? And we've said from the beginning that the whole point of the book of Mark is about who Jesus is. Okay, so I want you to turn really quickly, and we're not going to take time to preach the whole book again, but I want you to see something in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. He says right out of the gates what the whole thing's about. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So right up front, we know as the readers what's going on. Okay, we know who this man is. We've just been told that Jesus is the Christ, that is the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, the Savior of the people of God, the Son of God, okay? Um, We know know, uh, who he's writing about. We know who Jesus is. And the whole of this book is devoted to telling us the identity, telling us something about Jesus. But, But under that umbrella of who is Jesus being the broad topic, you could take Mark and you could split it into really three sections. I'm going to do this quickly, but I I want you to just kind of get a sense of context here, okay? The the first section of the book of Mark is actually a very lengthy section. It goes from chapter 1, verse 2, all the way to chapter 8 and verse 30, where Peter confesses Christ. And so the whole of this big section from chapter 1 and chapter 8 is all about demonstrating who Jesus is. Okay, so we're asking the question, who is it? And, and Jesus then demonstrates who he is, and he does that. And this is the section where you're going to see most of the miracles, most of the signs, the wonders, the healings, the exorcisms, where people are standing back and go, my gosh, he just, he just told the sea to shut up, and it did. And, 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 and this is where you see a lot of that happening. The next thing starts in chapter 8 and verse 31 and goes all the way to the end of chapter 10 where Chris and Steve in the last couple of weeks finished out. And by the way, if you were here, didn't they do a great job? Will you help me thank them for, for preaching in my stead? It is so awesome to me to know that I can leave at times and, uh, and there are very capable, godly, mature men who know how to bring the word of God to you. And it's the first time we've ever done this, anybody who's been around, where we've had them continue through the series that I'm in. And so it was really awesome uh, to have them just be able to, 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 to pick up where I left off and keep going. I think it's really good for you, by the way. I think it's really good for us. Uh, we can become very sort of leader, preacher centric, and we don't want that. We want to be Jesus centered at this church and, and don't want us worshiping any pastor or anybody because I speak the most or anything like that, that unless it's Chris delivering the word, it's not really the word. No, it's great that we get to sort of expand our bandwidth and, and learn to hear from other people. So I was super grateful for those guys doing that the last, uh, the, the, the last couple of weeks. So anyways, chapter 8, verse 31 is the, is the beginning of a new section. And that takes us all the way to the ch- end of chapter 10. And this whole section is not about demonstrating, it's about clarifying. Okay, what is, who is Jesus? Okay, and so three times Jesus in this little section predicts his death. Okay, I mean, he says, I'm going to die. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be beaten, spit upon. I'm going to be killed in three days I'll rise. Three times in this little section. And what he's doing is he's helping us understand what, what it 
what it, who he is so that we can clarify what discipleship is, what following him is. And so he's showing us that, that he's bringing into sharp focus this issue of discipleship. He's, he's showing us that discipleship touches every part of our life. And, and maybe most of all, he wants to make sure that you know, that I know, the cost of following him. There is a cost of following Jesus. I'm going to go die, and I'm asking you to die along with me. Hey, maybe it's not the physical torturous death of Jesus, but it's dying to ourselves all the time. Okay, so that's the se- second section. Now, this last section starts in chapter 11, verse 1, which we are where we are today, and it's going to go all the way to the end of Mark. Uh, and I'll tell you later why I believe this, and some of you will probably freak out when I tell you this, but I think the book of Mark ends in chapter 16, verse 8. Okay, and there's more you'll see in your Bibles. But, uh, but there's a lot of questions about whether or not that's original. So we'll deal with that later. But in any event, this section is all about proving. Okay, so there was demonstrating, there's clarifying, this is proving that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, and it's going to culminate in the resurrection. But apart from the resurrection, here's what's interesting. In this section, the only obvious miracle is what we'll see next week, and that's the cursing of a fig tree. Okay, it's a, it's a miracle of destruction. It's a miracle of wrath. It's a, it's a section, though, that in this last section, it's marked by the most teaching that Mark tells us about uh, from Jesus. And it's marked by the most conflict with this party called the Pharisees, this religious Jewish sect uh, of, uh, uh, of God's people that uh, are in conflict with Jesus. Because through it all, through this whole section, Jesus is going to, appro- to prove that he is the Messiah that the prophets talked about in the Old Testament. Okay? Now, there's some other things I want you to see about the book of Mark. Okay? And I want you, you, this is good for you to know as you read your Bibles. If you want to know the central thrust of any author of any book of the Bible, note how much time they spend, how many verses they spend on any given topic. Now, here's what's interesting about the book of Mark that you may not have noticed at first glance. In chapter 11, verse 1, we're on Palm Sunday. And in chapter 16, verse 8, we're at Easter. So a full third of this book is one week of Jesus' life. I mean, so far, this is like three, I mean, we've heard about the beginning, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is at least three years up to this point. And then Mark slows way down like the other gospel writers and tells us about the last week. In fact, that's what most of the gospel writers do, which ought to tell you that the central thrust of the Gospels is what? It's about the cross. This is where it all culminates. This is where everything is going. Okay, so, so, so Mark, we don't, we're not supposed to miss this. We're at Palm Sunday, and it's, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get there, but if we were going chronologically, we'd be at, we'd be at Easter next week. Okay, this is one week uh, in the life of Jesus that we're going to start today. He's been on the way to Jerusalem since chapter 8, verse 27, but now he gets to Jerusalem, he races to the finish line that he's been striving for since the day he was born. That's where we are. Okay, so that gives you the background, some context, so you can understand where we are in the book. So let's, let's kind of get after where we're, we're going today. Okay, what I want you to see is just a few things. And first of all, it's this. Jesus knew where he was going. Okay, he knew where he was going. This is important. Look at verse 1 of chapter 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage, now, Bethphage means, anytime you see the word Beth in a, in a name of a city, it's actually, a, the, the Greek would be Beit, or, or, or uh, it, it's the word just literally means house. And the last part of that means house of something. So Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, interestingly enough, is house of bread. Bethany, house of the poor or afflicted. Bethphage, house of figs, and he's going to do something with figs next week. But anyways, so there he is, and he says, when he, when he drew near to Bethphage at Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead of him. Okay, so here's the setting. 
Jesus has been traveling. He's been coming from the north. He's coming down from the Galilee region. He passes through Jericho. He goes past the city of Bethany, which will be sort of his retreat spot every evening, and, and, and through Bethphage and stands on the Mount of Olives and overlooks Jerusalem. And we're going to see what he does here in a minute. But, but, okay, the Mount of Olives, if you wanted to see the geography, sits on the east side of Jerusalem. Uh, if you go to Israel with us next year, which I'd love for a lot of you to do, um, uh, you need to let us know before the end of this month. But, uh, but in any event, we will stand on the Mount of Olives and we will look down, just like Jesus did, at, at the city of Jerusalem. So this is where he is. He's standing up on this mountain and he looks down and, uh, and it's an awesome awesome sight. I mean, it almost brings tear to your eyes if you're, if you're a believer in Jesus. You're like, <gasps> you know, you see this, you come up over the crest and there's the city. Okay, now, now, uh, so there he is. Now, in Zechariah 14.4, and you might want to make a note of this, the Mount of Olives, we're told from the prophet Zechariah, is the place where God would come in final judgment of Israel's enemies. So the the messianic expectation, if you will, is that, man, this Messiah is going to come. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to kick some butt, right? This is what he's going to do in, uh, on behalf of his people. In fact, again, when you go to Israel, you'll see this. Uh, devout Jews understood that the Messiah would come and would, if you will, touch down on the Mount of Olives. So, what you'll see is that on this side of the mountain, as it goes down into the city of Jerusalem, there are, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of what are called ossuaries. Ossuaries is just, it literally means a bone box. So when you read the Old Testament, you'll hear how Joseph died, they buried him, then they gathered his bones to his father. Well, this is what they do. They, they, take, they actually bear pe bury people in a cave somewhere. They sit there for maybe a year. They go back. They collect the bones. They take them. They put them in an ossuary. So there are ossuary boxes all over the Mount of Olives because expectant Jews said, that's where the Messiah, we want to be the first people to rise from the dead when the Messiah comes. Okay, so, so, so this is what's going on, and Jesus now comes, first time he's done it, stands on the hill of the, mount, uh, 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 of, of the mountain. He, he knows exactly where he's going. I'm headed into Jerusalem. This is why I came. Uh, I'm about to do something nobody quite can figure it out, but here I go. Okay, second thing I want you to see is Jesus knew he was the Messiah. There's some people that say, well, Jesus didn't know that. That kind of, he woke up to that expectation over a lifetime. No, no, he knew. Now, now look, f follow me here because I want you to see some things. Look at verse 2. Let's read 2 to 7. He said to them, uh, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt on which no one has ever sat. Untie it, bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away found a colt tied under a, uh, at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to him, what are you doing, untying the colt? They told him what Jesus said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Now, now you, you, you've probably heard, this is Palm Sunday, right? This is, this is the triumphal entry. Okay, there's a few things I want you to notice about Jesus. First of all, notice his prediction, his predictive powers, okay? First of all, he's very clear. Um, he says, you're going to go in and you will find a colt. I'm going to tell you what kind of animal is going to be there. It, it will be male. They will see it immediately upon entering the city. Uh, the colt will be tied up. No one will have ever sat on it, much less ridden it. Uh, someone might ask you, why are you untying the colt? And here's your answer. And it goes down exactly like Jesus said it was. You see his power here, his, 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 uh, or his, his prediction. He, he is, he's predicting, he's got these, he has the ability to know exactly what's coming. Now, now I realize, I told you, I, I said there's really no obvious miracles in this last section other than the cursing of the fig tree. But, but let, me, let me just say, uh, uh, this one is maybe a little less obvious, but, but just notice it, okay? Um, this is, if it's not a miracle, it's certainly incredibly unusual. 
That is, I think it's showing us that Jesus had perfect foreknowledge and, uh, of what was about to come. I know I'm going to go. He's already, I mean, we've seen this. He's, he's told them back in chapter 8, 9, 10 that I'm going to go. The rulers are going to persecute me, beat me, spit on me. I'm going to die. I mean, this is what Jesus says. I know what's coming. And so I'm now telling you what's going to happen right now when you walk in the city. And the fact, uh, Mark doesn't tell us, Mark doesn't say that Jesus had been and kind of, you know, prearranged this deal with this guy. Hey, tie it up here and, you know, when they come, kind of ask them a question, put them on edge and they'll answer you and, and then you can, you, can, you can let them go. No, it doesn't say that. He, he came down and th this is what happens. And the fact that he knew exactly where the cult would be, uh, that the owner would have questions, seems to indicate that Jesus had not prearranged to have this cult tied up and waiting for him. Okay, so, so his, his prediction. Second of all, uh, his power. Okay, he knows who he is. He, he knows this power. Now, now, here's what I find interesting here. Jesus, uh, Mark makes a point, uh, and Jesus makes a point of saying, no one has ever sat on this colt. Now, the other gospels tell us this colt was a donkey. Um, and think about that. The, the word Mark uses, he, he definitely uses a word that talks about a donkey, and this is a donkey no one had ever even sat on, much less ridden. <laughs> now, if that's not a miracle, that's pretty amazing. Now, I'm no donkey expert, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't just go hopping on their backs, right? Uh, and then they sort of willingly go along with you, because Jesus gets on the back of this donkey and rides it in Jerusalem. It's amazing. No, 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 but why did he make a point of saying it's unridden? Well, maybe that's part of us seeing his power. Um, why a donkey? Why, why, why? See, um, Jesus doesn't want to ride on an already ridden donkey, not because he's a germaphobe, you know, like, ooh, somebody's already ridden this donkey, that's gross. Um, in the Old Testament, what, what it, what, what's happening here is that, is, that, is that animals that had never been ridden on, had never been broken, were considered holy. They were acceptable. Only they were acceptable to God. You didn't ride your donkey, wear it out, and then go try to offer it to God. He'd be like, no. I get the best of your flock, unridden, unbroken, you bring it to me. This is how it works. Okay, so very subtly, I think, Mark is getting the point across that Jesus, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, is the Son of God, and only that which is holy, undefiled, is suitable for him. But let me show you one last thing, and that's his humility. Because here's the interesting question. Why a donkey? Here he is. We call this the triumphal entry. Why a donkey? Interestingly, the prophet Zechariah, again, in chapter uh, eight, 9, verse 9, says this. Listen, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. This is, this is a couple thousand years before Jesus ever came. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is what's happening? This is exactly what Jesus is fulfilling here. But, 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 but okay, he's fulfilling a scripture, but I think he's wanting to send a message to the people of Jerusalem that he's the one they've been waiting for. Here I come, riding on a donkey, exactly like Zechariah. Now you gotta understand, people in Jesus' day, if you were a devout Jew, some of you have never even heard of the book Zechariah. Okay, like, like a devout Jew, they didn't have internet and you know, they didn't have Xbox and Wii and, you know, all, they didn't have all these distractions. They had the Word of God. They knew the Word of God incredibly well. And so, so for them, they would see this and go, gosh, that seems like Zechariah. Here's riding on a donkey coming in to here. Okay. But, but, but more than just saying, I'm the Messiah... And this is part of my proof. I want you to see what it says about the Messiah. Now, let me take you back very quickly to what I said at the very beginning of this series. The person who's writing this is a guy named John Mark. Okay, he is most likely uh, a guy that ran with Peter and Paul and others. 
And, and most scholars believe the book of Mark is actually Peter's story, the Apostle Peter's story being told, and Mark is the scribe, and he's writing this down. And the, the original audience, now hear this, the original audience that received the book of Mark most likely was from Rome, the city of Rome. Now, You've seen Gladiator. You've seen the Roman, you know, and its greatness and its glory. And you've seen, you know, that kind of pomp and ceremony that goes on. Now, now if, if you're a Roman, right, you live in Rome, then you, you may not know anything about Zechariah's prophecy. But you know a whole lot about triumphal entries. Right? I mean, you, you've seen these things happen over and Rome was the powerhouse in the entire world. And how many times had citizens of Rome seen a Roman general ride triumphantly on the back of a war horse into the city with his entourage behind him? Right? How many times had they seen the pomp and the ceremony that surrounded a conquering hero? No, no doubt, just dozens, dozens of times as they came back from battle. I mean, they would watch, if we put it in modern terms, they'd watch these generals kind of come back into town with their fleet of black escalades and rims and, and, and security guards, right? The earpieces, the dark sunglasses riding on the side. You know, they saw them soak up the adoration, you know, people getting pushed out of the way, bask in the ticker tape parade. It was their moment, right? This is it. I'm coming into town. I'm the conquering hero. And, and this is what motivated them in the battle, right? Look, if I win... I win this battle. I get to come back in and I get the glitz and the glory and the pomp and the circumstance. Yes, it's Roman glory. How different is Jesus? Here he comes. And Mark's whole point is to show us how unlike the rulers of this world Jesus is. So different. I mean, here comes the king of the universe. The one that Paul says in Colossians that, that through him everything was made. There's nothing made that, that wasn't made by him. I mean, uh, and, and he holds everything together. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And here he comes. He stops storms with his words. He casts demons out of people with a word. He doesn't have to touch you. He can deliver you from disease, all these things. The one who does all this, he's filled with authority and power. And here he comes riding on a donkey the size, you know, fit for a hobbit. This is Jesus. He's accessible. He's humble. He's going to say of himself, come on, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weak and weary. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. <laughs> this is how Jesus describes himself. How do you think that rung in the ears of people who all they'd ever seen was pomp and ceremony, and if you want to be great, this is what it looks like. It looks like you standing up. It looks like you, you know, coming in as a conquering hero and everybody cheering for you. How different is greatness in the kingdom of God than greatness in the world? See, he knows he's the Messiah. There's no question in his mind, but he's not the Messiah that everyone expected. In fact, they believe, okay, so he's going to come, Messiah is going to come. He's going to come to Jerusalem. He's going to come by the way of Mount of Olives. He would storm into Jerusalem. He'd take care of business. And so Jesus absolutely shatters their expectations about what the Messiah would do. So much so that they just won't believe. So this is what Jesus does. I, I was just, somebody was asking me the other day about book of the Bible and all that, and, you know, they were, they were saying, well, you know, what do you think is going to happen at the end of time, and how's Revelation really going to play out? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> Seems to me that every time we try to do that, we get in big trouble. Seems to me every time the people of God get dogmatic about, here's what it's going to look like, God's like, no, no, you, you got it all wrong. That's what happened to the Pharisees, Right? He just shatters their ex. The people of God are notoriously bad when it comes to our attempts to predict, predict exactly how God is going to behave. 
right? So I mean, Jesus comes a baby. No one saw that coming. Okay, we can go back now. We, we know. I'm telling you, in the day, nobody saw that coming, right? No, it, Jesus is born of a virgin. No one saw that coming, right? Instead, his own people mocked Mary and, and you know, insinuated all the time, you're, you're not a virgin. You had a, you had a child out of wedlock, right? Jesus is born in Bethlehem. He's raised in Nazareth. Everyone knew nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Not possible. No way the Messiah comes from Nazareth. Jesus was a normal kid. He probably got picked last in baseball. Right? When, when, it, was, when it was game time on, on, you know, a, 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 and he was on the Little League team, he probably averaged, I don't know, 165, 169. I don't know. Just something, just average. No one saw that, right? No, no, no. He's going to be like super. This is why in the early church, there was all these like weird books that popped up to try and show that, no, no, Jesus wasn't a normal child. He was perfectly normal. He was fully man. No one saw that coming. Right? Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to be beaten, spit upon, mocked, killed. No one saw that. These guys still don't get it. Jesus hung on a cross. No one figured that was coming, right? He rose from the dead. No one saw that. In Revelation chapter 5, John says he's told to look, basically look, and you'll see a lion of Judah, the only one that's willing to, that worthy to open the seal on the scrolls in, in the book of Revelation. And John looks and he says, behold, I saw a lamb as though it was slain. I thought I was going to see a lion. And there's, there's a bloodied lamb standing there, and he's the one. See, nobody sees that. So whenever we think we've got God pegged, I figured it out, he breaks free. And this is what Jesus is doing. I'm going to shatter your expectations. Now, let me show you one last thing. The crowds sort of understood. <laughs> I know that's a very inartful way of saying this, but I, I couldn't make the point any better way. Okay? They sort of understood that Jesus was the Messiah. Let, let, let me show you what I mean. Um, so, so, so look down at verse 8. And many spread their cloaks on the road. Others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Let's stop right there. You know what? Uh, you read that and you're like, hey, this is pretty good. This sounds very promising. Jesus is getting the praise that he deserves. But, but, but hold on to your enthusiasm for a moment, okay? Because it looks like, hey, it's Palm Sunday. People are lining up, throwing down palm branches. They're throwing down their cloaks. They're getting other kind of branches. And they're shouting praise to Jesus. And you think, this, this is looking good. This is really promising. Okay? Now, some preachers will go... How sad. How sad because the same, the same crowd that, that worshipped him on Palm Sunday by this Friday will shout crucify him. That sounds really awful, right? I mean, they're just, they're fickle. That's what happens with people. So your problem is we worship God and we crucify him. And, you know, that, okay, that's good. That makes a point. But, but that's not true. These are not the same people. I don't believe it is. Um. So who are these people that right now are at least shouting worship to Jesus? Well, I, I think this is what's happening. These are pilgrims that are coming from the Galilee region along with Jesus or have joined his party along the way. Okay, and here's why I say that. Listen, Jesus isn't traveling just kind of going, you know, guys, it seems like now's a good time to start heading to Jerusalem. He picks a very strategic time. He wants to be there for Passover, the largest gathering of Jews in the city of Jerusalem. I mean, uh, Josephus, an, uh, a first century uh, historian who, who sort of sided with the Romans, but he was a Jew, talked about how at that time of year, at the Passover, you would be overrun by Jewish pilgrims coming to the city and all kinds of livestock that were going to be offered in sacrifice. Is this very, I mean, the roads to Jerusalem are really busy this time of year. 
And here comes Jesus. So, so he chooses this time intentionally, and he is one of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of pilgrims who make this trek. So Mark says, the people who shouted were those who went before and those who followed, he says. In other words, these are probably people that followed him on the way, all the way down from Galilee. So they're part of his ministry, perhaps. In fact, if you remember two weeks ago, Stephen preached on chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. And, and, and in, in verse 32, you'll read that, that uh, his followers who were going with him were amazed. He's walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. This isn't just 12 guys. There's an entourage that's going with. Now, I think it's the same group here in chapter 11. Okay, so now we know from Scripture that there were more than 12 disciples that followed him. We know he called, there, you 12, you're kind of my inner group, and, uh, but then there's all these other people that surround him. In fact, in chapter three, verse seven, we hear that a great crowd follow him. In Luke, Luke tells us that Jesus didn't just send out the 12 at one point, he sent out 72 followers ahead of him. Go into the cities and towns and I'm gonna follow up behind you. So by the time we get to Acts two, Jesus is dead now. There's 120 people gathered in an upper room. So Jesus, you know, for lack of a better term, has these groupies who are with him. But in addition to his followers, there would have been a huge group of pilgrims traveling. And so these are not the same people that wanted him crucified. We're told the people of Jerusalem are saying crucify him. So, so what do I mean when I say that these people sort of understood that Jesus was the Messiah? Well, look what they did. They, they spread out their cloaks. They threw palm branches. This is, the, I mean, we're going to give this man the red carpet treatment. Okay, that's, that's exactly, this is like rolling out the red carpet and somebody walking on it. And then they shout praises. So this, this is like, okay, we, we, we kind of, we're, we're, you know, we're with you. But here's what's happening. Okay, as Jews traveled, um, as pilgrims came, and by the way, you always go up to Jerusalem, always. You could be 7,000 feet higher, and they always in Scripture talk about going up to Jerusalem. So, so they always are going up, and so this is why in the Psalms you're going to run into 14, 15 Psalms, Psalm 120 to 134, that are called the Psalms or Songs of Ascent. They're going up to, and they would sing these songs, these encouraging songs to one another. There's another group of songs, uh, of psalms that they would sing to each other, and they were called the Hallel Psalms, chapter, Psalm 113 to 118, okay? And you can see these, and, and uh, uh, but these are, these are psalms of praise. We, we get our, in fact, it's where we get our word Hillel, Hallelujah! This is the same place. Okay, so these are these are praise psalms, and I mean now, w w so 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 they're, they're, th these psalms were, were saying Hallelujah simply means praise Yah, Halle Hallelujah. Okay, that just means praise Yah, which is shorten Yahweh, God. Okay, so what's happening? I know it's a lot of background, but what's happening in verses nine and ten here is they are singing a stanza from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. So, so here's, what, here, here's what they'd do. They'd walk along, and somebody would sing one stanza, somebody else would sing another. They'd, they'd sing these in antiphonal ways, okay? That is, you know, they'd, they'd go back and forth. So, so one person would start, the other person would answer. One group would sing, you know, one part, the other, per, the, the, the other group would, would go to the next, okay? It, you know, think of like the, the army guy, you know, uh, who's marching, sound off, sound off. You know, they kind of do this back and forth thing. Well, this is kind of what's happening among the Jews. They're encouraging one another with the praise of God, and so someone would say, Hosanna, and they'd answer, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then the other person would say, Hosanna, and they'd go back, and that person would say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what is Hosanna? Hosanna means save us. Save us, God. Uh, and, the, and, and the blessing was kind of like a, in this time, was kind of like a greeting 
Okay, so, so um, they, would, they would see each other. Okay, you're here you are traveling, and here come a new traveler, and somebody would go, Hosanna! And they'd go, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's like, bless you. You know, you're coming in the name of the Lord. And so this is not, this is not messianic. Blessed is that Messiah who comes in the name of It's you. You're, are, are you coming in the name of the Lord? Bless you. That, 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 that's what that psalm means, okay? So, that, that is Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, but they add some new twist to it. Because look what they say in, in Mark. Hosanna, blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father, David. That is not in Psalm 118. So, so, so here they are going, okay, I see Jesus is different. But I don't know that he's the fulfillment of what we see in Psalm 118. I, there's something less in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of David. He's not, you know. So, 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 so when I say they understood sort of, I mean that they knew Jesus was different from the rest of the crowd, but that they didn't mean they were actually worshiping or believing in him. And I'll show you why. I, I firmly believe this in just a second. But let me just do it this way. Let's suppose it's December 25th, 24th. We're shopping at Arcadia Mall. Okay, and, and here we are, and we look, and you've got your little children beside you, and you look down the mall, and here comes a man, and he's got this long white beard, and he's pretty rotund, and red velvet pants, and a hat and shirt, and this, you know, big belt, and the big boots, and all of that, and he's got, you know, jingle bells on the side of him, and so you yell out, Santa! Merry Christmas! Ho, ho, ho! Right, kids? It's great! And they're like, oh, Santa! Now, you play along with what's being acted out, don't you? Now, do I have any little children in here? <laughs> do, do you believe it's Santa? Careful, careful. I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Probably not. Probably not. But you're playing along. Right? You're like, okay, it's, 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 it's Santa. You, you may just be caught up in the excitement of the moment. That's exactly what's happening. In fact, John tells in John chapter 12, verse 16, says his followers didn't understand until after he was glorified, that is, raised from the dead and resurrected, like, and, and, and went to heaven. So some people seeing Jesus on a donkey are going, hey, Zachariah, he's playing the part. This is great. I like that. He's kind of the Santa figure. And so, bless, you know, bless is he who comes in. Hosanna in the highest. All these things. But it's not real faith. It's excitement. It's good. It's not real belief. See, they like the excitement. They like the singing. They like what Jesus represents. But they don't really worship Jesus. In fact, Mark says... That's it. Okay, did you notice? Did you, some, of your, some of your, like the ESV does this, and I don't know, verse 11 is kind of off on its own. And he entered Jerusalem and went in the temple. When he looked around at everything, it was already, already late, and he went out to Bethany with the 12. With the 12. Where is everybody? They're gone. They're done. I mean, this is real worship. When you think, oh my gosh, the Messiah's here. Wherever he's going, I'm going. They just kind of go, oh, we're playing the part. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Look at this guy. He's kind of playing the Messiah part right now. And now we're done. In fact, James Edwards, a scholar, says this. This text is traditionally called the triumphal entry. That's an appropriate designation for Matthew and John, but scarcely for Mark. Mark's account is noteworthy for what does not happen. The whole scene comes to nothing. Like the seed in the parable of the sower that receives the word with joy but has no root and lasts but a short time, the crowd disperses as mysteriously as it had assembled. Mark is warning against mistaking enthusiasm for faith and popularity for discipleship. Does that describe you? So you, there, look, I don't know anybody that says, I don't like Jesus. 
Okay, I, I'm sure they're there, right? I'm sure they're out there. I'm just saying, I, I haven't met them. Maybe you have. But most people, certainly most Americans, you like Jesus? Oh, it's great. Got no problems with that guy. You like hanging around with Jesus? You like the excitement, perhaps, if you don't? I, I like kind of coming to church. I, I feel better. Kind of get my little, you know, buzz for the week and I'm out. It's kind of a good thing to do in my life. You feel good, right? You go to chapel, whatever, at, at school. You, you sing. You're into Jesus as long as it's exciting. Because when the fanfare stops, you're not that into Jesus anymore. You like the singing. You like the loud music. You like the electric guitar, the drums, whatever. You, you, you like kind of the enthusiasm. You like the fun stuff. You just don't like the cross. You just don't like the dying part. You don't like chapter 8 through 10 or, or what's going to happen here shortly. You like all the triumphalism. You don't like the cross. So is the crowd fickle? Is this crowd fickle? Yeah, but not because they're going to turn around and demand crucify him. But because they will turn around and decide they want all the glory, they want all the glamour, they don't want the cross. That's so common. But now look how it ends, okay? So he enters Jerusalem. He goes in the temple. When he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So here's Jesus, apparently alone, walks in. He's going to come back tomorrow. But for right now, the crowds are gone. And like a commander surveying the battlefield before the battle, Jesus steps into the temple and looks because this, mark my words, this is where the battle happens. What's the temple? The temple is the center of Israel's worship. And Jesus is going to come in there, and he's going to duke it out. And what's going to end up happening is he's saying, no, no, no. The center of Israel's worship must move from this temple to this temple, to me, to Jesus. And they're going to put up a huge fight. It's not going to come without a battle. In fact, it's not going to come without Jesus laying down his own life. This just is the calm before the storm. There's a part that Mark doesn't tell us, so turn over to, to Luke chapter 19. I want to just show you something real quick. Okay, so Luke chapter 19. He leaves the city. He goes up and he draw, it says, and, and, and when he drew near and saw the city, verse 41 of Luke 19, he wept over it. This is, this is the aftermath of what we just saw, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And then Mark says he goes out to Bethany. See, see, Jesus lives a city. He goes up on the mountain again, and he weeps over Jerusalem. Why? Because he says in Luke 19, you did not know the time of your visitation. That is going to be the banner over so many people in this world. I fear that that's probably true of a lot of people in the church today. The Bible says in all kinds of ways, all kinds of ways, now is the acceptable hour. Today is the day of salvation. The writer of Hebrews says, if today you hear the voice of the Lord, don't harden your heart against it. Listen, here's what some of you think. Just like Jerusalem, God will always behave toward me today in the future, the way he does toward me today. 
I'll always know God as this, uh, the way he is right now. now. God will always act in mercy toward me. God will always be forgiving. And you don't realize God is offering you mercy and forgiveness now because someday it will be too late. Someday the door will be slammed and destruction will come. This is what Jesus is saying. And Jesus weeps over you because you don't realize he is visiting you right now. The fact that you're sitting in a church hearing the word of God is his mercy. He wants to forgive you in humility and grace towards you. But there is a day when Jesus, the Bible says, you read it, go to Revelation chapter 19. The next time he comes, he's not riding a donkey, meek and lowly. He's coming on a horse and he's going to be tattooed up and down his thighs. And it's going to say, King of kings and Lord of lords. And his his gown is going to be drenched in blood and he's going to come in wrath. And it will be too late if that's the day you say, have mercy on me. Now's the day. He's here. And he weeps over Jerusalem. You didn't even, I came. I walked into the city just now. And I walked back out. And nobody even recognized me. Here I am. Jesus is here. We live in a day by the grace and mercy of God where that grace and mercy is available. And if you assume that it will always be that way, you assume to your peril. It won't. And so today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, bow your knee to him, do it. He's the Messiah, he's the king, and he's here to save you. Let's pray.